In helping thousands of people build their apps on Bubble, there are five mistakes that nearly everyone makes that don't actually seem like mistakes in the moment, but they can lead to surprising consequences later on. In this video, we'll walk through each of those five mistakes so you can build your app correctly the first time and avoid those consequences altogether. And stick around until the end because our last one has to do with your app security and it's critical you get this right. The first mistake is setting up all of the default values for your inputs in the placeholder setting. This is wrong. You don't want to do this. Most input elements, so multi-line inputs, single line inputs, checkboxes, dropdowns, file uploaders, anything the user can interact with to make a selection or type something in, they'll typically offer you a way to um, provide a default value so that it can be pre-populated with something. There will also typically be a setting for placeholders. These are two very different things. Again, you don't want to put your default values in the placeholder setting. This, is, this can lead to bad data being saved to your database, right? You could end up overwriting fields with blank values or just saving the wrong information to the record. And that can create a whole ripple effect of issues with your data set. And this is something that is not obvious to a lot of folks who are putting these together because the way that you set up a placeholder is very similar to the way you set up an, an initial content or a default value. The settings are typically very close together. And when you're testing the page, when you're previewing it, it can look like the input has a default value when it's really just showing you the placeholder. But you want to be very careful not to mix these up because having a placeholder does not give the input a value. That, that input is still technically empty. So it's really easy to mix this up. So pay attention to where you are setting up your default values with your inputs. Another mistake we see come up over and over again is overcomplicating your group data sources in your design canvas. This is something that can lead to more error in your logic. It can make things harder to troubleshoot. Um, it can also create a disorganized and messy editor for you on the back end. Honestly, there's a lot of ripple effect that can happen here if you don't have a consistent system for defining your group's data sources. So there's a lot of different ways to put a, a data source or attach a data source to a group. And that's only if you need to, all right? We also see folks setting up data sources on containers that just don't even need them. Just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? right? You should only set them up if, if you're gonna actually have elements inside of those containers that need to reference those data sources. Only create what you need. Um, but you'll find that there are many ways to get to a data source. Um, and so as long as you're consistent in that expression, in that path to that record or that custom state, that API response, um, that's the important thing. Again, don't overdo it. If it's going to be pulling from the page, always reference the page. If it's going to be pulling from one primary container, always reference that primary container. This is especially true when you have nested groups. It's really easy to mess up the data sources there if you're not paying attention to inner groups that don't have a data source, right? You've just cut off the access to that information for all the elements inside. Or if you start mixing and matching references to other areas, it can get very messy and just kind of hard to follow. Okay, so remember to create a consistent system for yourself. Um, that way it's easier for you to troubleshoot, to ensure that you catch any mistakes early on uh, and that your logic overall is much more reliable. This is something that uh, we, we see come up all the time because um, Bubble's not going to tell you when something is set up properly or if there's a better way to do it. It's only going to tell you what's technically uh, required to make something function. So if you've defined, uh, you know, if, if there's a required field somewhere and you are missing a value, then Bubble will flag it. But as far as the way that you approach certain um, uh, queries for data, setting up your data sources, if it's technically correct, Bubble's not going to know what you're doing. So it's not going to tell you like, hey, you should actually do it this other way because it's more efficient or you're going to save yourself a lot of time, you know, looking for this thing later on. Right. So uh, this is why these things are easy to overlook. So form these good habits earlier on um, so that moving forward, you save yourself a lot of time. The next mistake we see is placing conditions in the wrong spot within your workflows. Both workflow events and workflow actions can take conditions. And depending on what you're building, depending on your logic and what your intended behavior is for the page or the interaction, it's going to matter where you place that condition. 
Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you get the exact same result no matter where you put it. But this is important to be very aware of what logic you are putting together and asking Bubble to do. Okay, because if you have the wrong condition in the wrong spot, if it's supposed to be at the event level and you have it in the action level or vice versa, you could end up with a uh, behavior that you don't want to you know, be executing. It could be technically correct. And this is why it's easy to um, make these mistakes. It's easy to miss this because technically the build makes sense from Bubble's perspective. It's not going to flag you or anything, but it may not give you the intended behavior. OK, so remember that when you have a condition at the event level, that's the first thing that bubble is going to check. And if it doesn't pass that condition, nothing else runs within that workflow. All right. If it passes the condition, then it will move on to the actions. So you want to be careful with this, um, not just for performance reasons, but also just intended behavior. Really common mistake we see um, or common consequence that comes out of this because of this mistake is back to back actions with opposing conditions. So only one of them are, you know, it's expected that one of them should run and not the other one. So they have opposite conditions. But in some cases, the action itself changes the environment. It may make a change to a database record or a custom state where it then makes the very next action pass as well. And so they both end up running and you end up with, again, behavior you didn't want. You could end up with bad data being saved to the database or the user experience something that you didn't intend. So if you need to split up your workflows into more uh, events, that might be the solution. If you need to add terminate actions within your workflow so that you prevent uh, you know, multiple actions from running when you, didn't, when you don't mean to, um, you know, or, or having a combination of different conditions at the event and at the action level. Again, it really does depend on what you're doing and not all workflows are created equal. So some of them, it will matter. Some of them, it really won't, but be very mindful of where you place the condition. The next mistake we see come up is not reusing data sources or on the flip side of this, over searching your database or over calling APIs. Right. The more redundant you are, the less optimized your logic is. If you do a search for something in your database and you know you're going to be referencing that result in multiple places in your workflows, in your design, try as much as you can to save that result somewhere that so it can be referenced later on. So this could be in a custom state. Maybe you're saving these results to a record in the database. What you don't want to do is to have to do the exact same search over and over and over again, or do multiple API calls over and over and over again. It just leads to an inefficient, uh, you know, application that could even slow down the experience for the user. You're asking Bubble to do more work behind the scenes when it really doesn't have to. You want to look for these opportunities where you can consolidate things it, that will use less workload units, right? So that's more cost effective for you. Um, and in general, if Bubble has already done the work of fetching information, then it's going to be much faster to reference that, that same information in all of the you know, other areas in that design. Again, whether it's in workflows or in the page design. Of course, if you need to manipulate that information for specific areas, you can still do that. But think about where the primary data source is, um, how you're going to get it, where it's going to live for future references. Try to make it as consolidated as much as possible. Try not to do a separate search for the exact same thing multiple times because that really makes things inefficient um, on your end. This is just another one of those areas where Bubble's not going to flag this kind of thing for you. If you're building everything technically in a way that makes it function, Bubble doesn't know what you're doing. So it can't suggest to you, hey, we see this search happening five different times. Why don't you try reducing it into one place? Because there's so many different variables of how that could look you know, where, where those things can be done in your app, Bubble's never going to suggest that for you. It is up to you to craft that logic together. So this is something that you, you certainly want to keep top of mind. The next mistake we see is not setting up restrictions to access your pages. This is really important when you have user logins involved, maybe different roles and permissions that you've created for your users. If there's different behavior that logged in users need to see versus logged out users, most data driven applications where their user accounts are going to have some level of an access uh, rights system involved here. You need to pay attention to who can access the page in general, right? Not just the data on the page, but who is allowed on the page. 
you don't have these restrictions set up, you're going to end up with security problems. You're going to end up with data exposed to users. You could just end up with non-functioning pages if, if the wrong type of user is looking at it, right? A whole ripple effect of privacy and security problems and even just user experience, right? Now, this is another area where, you know, it's easy to miss because Bubble doesn't know what you're doing. It doesn't know who you want to allow or not allow on the page. It's up to you to create that logic. So at very minimum, the very minimum, you want to have um, on any internal pages, pages that should be accessed by logged in users only, make sure to have a workflow at the page level where when the user is logged out, you do something about it, right? You either redirect them to another page so that they can log in or sign up. Maybe you show a pop-up that can't be closed so that they can log in from there, show them a message, letting them know why they can't access this page, help them get oriented. Don't just get them stuck there. And the last thing you want is to have them on that page being able to access things they shouldn't. So if they're logged out, do something with that logged out person. And if they're logged in, but they're the wrong type of person, um, handle that as well, right? If you have user roles that you've defined for your logged in users, make sure that the current user has the appropriate role for the page. Now, this is very app dependent, you know, your permissions are your permissions are custom to you. So think about what your user's experience should be like. Think about those uh, those edge cases. You know, this is error handling. It's not the, the, the normal path that you're building for, but you have to think about the abnormal path. What happens if somebody who's not supposed to be on this page finds themselves here? Even if you've made it as much as possible impossible to do that, People will find a way. So handle that so that uh, you don't hit any issues with security. That's the most important thing here. All right. So page restrictions, really important. Now, each of these mistakes is a technical tactic in Bubble. But in order to build your app properly, you need both these technical tactics plus an overarching strategy and development methodology to go along with it, like the order in which to build your features, how to prioritize design versus database, and so much more. And to get a complete walkthrough of even more tactics like the ones we just went over, plus that bigger picture strategy that ties all of these tactics together, the next step is to watch our free scalable app workshop over at coachingnocodeapps.com slash workshop. So head there now to ensure you build your bubble application properly the first time.